Hey everyone, Nick Ravellis here, and this is the San Diego Opera Podcast. I thought it might be interesting today to explore the origins of the story of Puccini's opera, Madama Butterfly. You perhaps know how the composer, who was in London in 1900, to attend to the premiere of Tosca at Covent Garden, he took an evening off to see a play at the Duke of York's Theatre. The play was David Belasco's Madame Butterfly, and it was on its first world tour after opening at the Herald Theatre in New York in March of that same year. According to Belasco, the playwright, Puccini ran backstage after the performance begging, begging for the rights to the play and throwing his arms around the playwright with tears running down his cheeks in order to press his point. He really wanted this. The story might be something of an exaggeration, but it's a fact that as soon as Puccini got back to Italy from England, he had his publisher look into securing the rights to the play. But it may be of interest to you to know where Belasco got the story in the first place. His play was based on a short story published in the Century Magazine in 1897 by a Philadelphia attorney, John Luther Long. The outline of the original story is not terribly different from the play or the opera. A young U.S. naval lieutenant stationed in Nagasaki, Japan, marries a young geisha according to Japanese custom, that being that the marriage could be dissolved any time after a month's abandonment. He eventually leaves her, but he promises to return when, I quote, the robins build their nests again, unquote. When he does return, it's with an American wife and the intention to take custody of the child that the geisha has borne him. Now, at the end of Long's story, the geisha attempts harakiri, but she's unsuccessful. She's brought back to health by her maid, and they simply leave their little house. The lieutenant returns again, only to find that the house has been deserted with no sign of his former young Japanese wife. Now, Belasco's play follows the same basic structure, but in his version, the geisha, Chocho-san, is successful in her suicide attempt, and it was this, of course, that struck at the hearts of those who saw it at the Duke of York Theatre, as well as Puccini, and audiences, frankly, that have seen the opera ever since. There were other similar stories, like the novel Madame Chrysanthème by Pierre Lotti. It was based on his own service as a French sailor in Japan who found himself married in Japanese custom to a geisha. In this novel, the protagonist and the Westerners in general treat the Japanese with contempt. And when it was published in 1887, it was even found to be quite offensive by many readers. It was written with a decidedly colonialist point of view, that the Japanese were inscrutable, that they were strange, even inhuman. A racist theme runs through this and other similar works that was considered out of step, even in those relatively uninformed times. With much of that offensive material removed, the French composer André Messager produced an opera based on that novel that appeared in 1893. It had a decent run, but it certainly never achieved the popularity of Puccini's opera. The existence in European culture of similar stories of Westerners confronting an Asian culture with dire results was based on the intense interest in all things Japanese in the latter half of the 19th century. Japanese arts took Paris by storm at the 1867 Universal Exposition, and from that time on, Asian motifs began to appear in the work of even Western artists. That trend was called Orientalism, and it appeared in the music of the period, adding exotic flavors to operatic and symphonic fare. One need only think of Rimsky-Korsakov's Scheherazade, Delib's Lakme, or even Verdi's Aida, to hear the kind of inspiration given to 19th century classical music by any culture that was east of Turkey. The difference between Puccini's opera and other works about confrontations between east and west is that the composer's sympathy is completely with Chocho-san, the young geisha bride. He presents Pinkerton, the naval lieutenant, as a kind of sexual opportunist. He's marrying simply to stave off the loneliness of his time in Japan. His lack of a serious commitment to this relationship is strongly contrasted to Chocho-san's complete and utter love for him, sacrificing her religion, her youth, and even her family for him. 
In fact, Pinkerton, even though he's got some beautiful music written for him in the opera, especially in the love duet at the end of the first act, comes off as kind of a selfish cad. As a metaphor for America's colonialist and careless approach to the Far East, and particularly its rather one-sided approach to trade and its dismissal of the realities of Japanese culture, Puccini and his librettists seem to me to have been right on. But that's not to say that there are no problems with the opera's treatment of some of the Japanese characters, especially how Butterfly herself comes off as a diminutive, powerless, childlike woman, all racial stereotypes of Asian women that were common at the time. It's difficult to square those things with our more enlightened understanding of world culture today, and it gives you an inkling of some of the problems that a stage director and opera singers have when they confront the production or the performance of this opera. And later on in this series, we'll get into that, particularly with the artists that arrive to produce our butterfly. So more about that at a later time. I'm Nick Ravellis, and I'll see you at the opera.